Yes, this briefing is being aired live on YouTube. A reminder to maintain audio quality to please remain muted until it's time to ask your question. If you're on the phone and are able to do so, please use star six to mute and unmute. Joining us for today's media briefing are Governor Tony Evers and DHS Secretary-designee Andrea Palm. Also available to answer questions are Dr. Ryan Westergaard, the Chief Medical Officer for the DHS Bureau of Communicable Diseases, Ryan Nilsestoon, the Chief Legal Counsel in the Office of the Governor, and Deb Standridge, the Chief Executive Officer of the Alternate Care Facility. We'll begin the briefing with remarks from Governor Tony Evers. Good afternoon and thanks again for joining us. As we continue to fight the COVID-19 pandemic and its many effects on the health and safety of Wisconsinites, we also need to keep in mind how these challenges are affecting workers in Wisconsin and their families and our state's economic recovery. Earlier this week, we announced a new partnership between DWD and Google Cloud to help our state process unemployment insurance claims and pandemic unemployment assistance claims more efficiently. And today we have another encouraging update out of the Department of Workforce Development. The DWD began releasing lost wages assistance benefits last Thursday and will continue to make payments over the next week. The lost wages assistance program is a FEMA program that provides an additional $300 per week to eligible folks who certify that they were unemployed or partially unemployed due to the pandemic. This $300 a week in additional support can help families and individuals make ends meet as we continue to navigate these times. And it's estimated this will total another roughly $224 million into the hands of up to 220,000 claimants. As I've said before, there isn't a worker or a family or an industry that hasn't felt the effects of this pandemic. And that includes Wisconsin's tourism industry, which was a uh, two, excuse me, $22 billion industry in 2019. That's why as part of our major investments in small businesses and economic stabilization, we also invested nearly $12 million in providing support through our travel grant program. And this week we announced that travel grants have been awarded to 158 grantees to help Wisconsin's tourism promotion and development organizations resume business operations and restore economic activity. Tourism plays an important role in Wisconsin's economy and we're glad that the travel grants can provide some much needed relief as the tourism industry and frankly, our entire state works towards recovery. This week also marked the beginning of in-person early absentee voting in the state of Wisconsin. And we've seen amazing turnout so far. On Tuesday, the first day of early in-person voting, folks from Eau Claire to Milwaukee to Stevens Point turned out to vote with nearly 80,000 Wisconsinites early voting in person. We also passed the 1 million mark for absentee votes cast either by mail or in person. Now that's great news, Wisconsin, and I expect those numbers will continue to grow over the next two weeks. So this is your reminder that you don't have to wait until November 3rd to vote. Voting early can also help your local clerk and crowds, but by allowing them to start counting ballots right away on election day. If you have your absentee ballot, make sure to get it in the mail as soon as possible, drop it off at an official drop box or at your, at your early voting locations in your neighborhood. If you want to vote in person, you can find the hours and locations for your local municipality by visiting myvote.wi.gov or by contacting your local clerk's office. Our clerks are doing great work and they work tirelessly in every corner of the state to ensure that we have a successful election. They've adapted to the challenges brought on by the pandemic while also following state law and adapting when things change. So when you go, go to vote, you need to bring your photo ID, but then make sure you're helping keep other voters, our clerks and our poll workers safe by bringing your mask, some hand sanitizer, and even your own black or blue pen if you can. If you need to learn more about what's on your ballot, check your voter registration or find your polling place. Again, visit myvote.wi.gov. Finally, I'll close today on an unfortunately somber note. 
Sec Secretary Destiny Palm will provide today's updated numbers in just a moment. But as of yesterday, 1,681 Wisconsinites have lost the battle against this virus, with 48 Wisconsin lives lost yesterday alone. This was the highest single day number of deaths in the state of Wisconsin. Kathy and I send our deepest condolences to their families, their friends, their loved ones, and our thoughts are with the 182,687 who are still struggling with a positive COVID-19 test result and the many Wisconsinites who have been hospitalized in the last few days. We've seen high levels of COVID-19 hospitalizations with some regions reporting over 90% of their ICU beds in use. Wisconsin continues to see high levels of COVID-19 hospitalizations with some re regions reporting over 90% utilization of ICU beds. We also admitted our first patient to the alternative, alternate care facility at State Fair Park yesterday. And to those who say this pandemic has been blown out of proportion or that there isn't a real risk, folks, there's flat out wrong. Wisconsinites in every corner of our state have experienced this virus firsthand. Families have lost loved ones. They've lost mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, grandparents, and best friends. And our nurses, healthcare staff, and physicians are working long, frankly, emotionally exhausting hours on the front lines, caring for COVID patients and putting their own health and safety on the line. Make no mistake about this. This is an urgent crisis. If this weren't absolutely serious, and if this wasn't an emergency, I wouldn't be sitting here twice a week asking you to stay home, physically distance, and wear a face covering whenever you're out. Right now, we need to listen to the public health experts, and we need to believe in science, not deny it. The best thing we can do for our COVID-positive neighbors, friends, and family is to stay home, wear a mask, and continue to take every precaution to stop the spread of this virus and look out for one another. With that, I'll now turn things over to Secretary Designee Andrea Palm for her update. Andrea, take it away. Thanks, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us again today. I'll start with the numbers again uh, because they really do underscore what the Governor just talked about and the severity of the situation here in our state. There are now 186,100 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Wisconsin. That's an increase of 3,413 over yesterday. Our seven-day average of new cases is 3,396. One month ago, that number was 1,838. And two months ago, it was 707. We've now lost 1,703 Wisconsinites to COVID-19, an increase of 22 over yesterday. In mid-September, Wisconsin had 15 counties that were at very high COVID activity level. Five weeks later, 68 of our 72 counties are above the very high threshold of at least 350 people infected with COVID-19 for every 100,000 residents. In fact, the case burden in some of our counties are five, six, and even eight times higher than that threshold. COVID-19 is everywhere in our state, and it's still spreading. When activity level is this high and the trajectory of our cases is growing, gatherings of any size are not safe. Interacting with people outside of your household can easily spread the virus. And once the chain of transmission starts, it can lead to serious infections and hospitalizations across our communities. Across the state, COVID-19 hospitalizations have increased 22% this week compared to last week. In the Northwest region, that increase is much higher at 52%. The number of COVID-19 patients in the ICU is also much higher than before. Across Wisconsin, we have seen an increase of almost 21%. In two regions, that increase is 50% or higher. A week after opening the alternate care facility, we admitted our first patient yesterday, and we have one patient there today. These are stark numbers. 
And with our current surge in cases, our hospital numbers are going to get worse before they get better. We must take action immediately to stop transmission and get Wisconsin moving in the right direction again. Please stay home. Limit your interactions with people to only the people that you live with. Wear a mask, physically distance, wash your hands, get tested if you have symptoms or have been exposed to COVID-19, notify your contacts, and quarantine as you wait for your results and self-isolate if you test positive. To ensure that everyone who needs a test can get a test, DHS is partnering with the Wisconsin National Guard and local and tribal health departments to expand testing access to 70 new sites around the state. So please, if you need a test, get a test. You can find testing sites in your community by going to dhs.wisconsin.gov and clicking on the link that says Community Testing Site. With your help, we can stop the spread, save lives, and get Wisconsin through this crisis. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll now take your questions. A reminder to maintain audio quality to stay muted until it's time to ask your question. And we'll begin today with Matt Jarko from NBC 26 in Green Bay. Matt. Uh, yes, thanks for taking the call. This is John filling in for Matt. Uh, we we're uh, wondering today in Green Bay, a local hospital began testing anyone with or without symptoms for COVID-19. Uh, they said this is in part due to resources provided through the state health department. Can you tell us, is this a key to slowing the spread of the virus and should we expect more resources like this to be made available? So I'll ask Dr. Westergaard to dig into the details, but obviously um, our community testing program and the uh, increased access we're trying to provide around the state with these new sites um, uh, really is about uh, understanding where the disease is, right? It is the the way we start to be able to take public health action to stop the spread, who who is positive, the, and, and testing is the way you find out the answer to that question. And so we do think it's really important uh, for folks uh, uh, who need a test to get a test, and, and we really are anxious um, for folks to check out uh, where their community testing sites are in their communities and get a test if they need one. But Dr. Westgard, you may want to speak to the asymptomatic part of that. Sure. I think it's very likely that the majority of new cases in the state are the result of transmission from someone that doesn't have symptoms. So that's a really important thing for people to understand about this virus. It's different than than most other diseases. Most of the time, someone who has symptoms are, is, the, is the source of most infections. Now, it's true with this virus that if people have symptoms, they are more highly infectious. But the fact that so many, that so many people can be infected without symptoms, and the fact that there's so many of them puts that at really the highest priority of, of stemming the tide of new infections. So yes, the highest priority for, for testing people are with those with symptoms, because we need to get them out of, out of contact with those. The second tier is people who have been exposed. So a household member of someone who has tested positive, regardless of symptoms, should be tested as soon as they can. But in this environment where this, the virus is spreading silently throughout the whole state, we're not going to make a dent unless we test people without symptoms. This, the, you know, we need to develop strategies to do that in a coordinated way. But right now, it's inappropriate, in my view, for anyone to get turned away from a test because they're concerned that they've been exposed, even if they haven't been identified by a contact tracer as having been exposed. That's the situation where we are now. This virus is spreading silently. We have to presume that it's everywhere. And anyone that has access to a test should get a test. Thank you, Matt, or John. Now to Danny Maxwell from WKOW-TV in Madison. Danny? Hi, I wanted to ask a, a question about contact tracers. Dane County uh, is kind of telling us as of yesterday they no longer can guarantee a contact tracer will be able to reach out to people who are positive. Um, and so I'm just wondering if there still is an effort to get more contact tracers or if we're beyond that point and what the current contact tracers are doing. Are they still interviewing cases that they had already been interviewing or are they moving on to other duties? Yeah, thanks, Danny. And um, again, Dr. Osgood may, may want to dig in here a little bit, but I would say um, we at the state, uh, well, let me step back and acknowledge that the public health infrastructure in the state of Wisconsin when it comes to contact tracing uh, is, is, is beyond its capacity. Uh, 
Um, uh, what Dane County announced yesterday and what we're hearing certainly from other local public health departments is that they cannot keep up uh, with their new daily positive cases as it relates to be a, being able to effectively do contact tracing. It speaks uh, really urgently to the need for all of us to, to take the actions together that are necessary to stop the spread, to take that pressure off the local public health infrastructure so we can get back to a place where, uh, where we can contact trace uh, in a more effective way. Uh, in answer specifically to your contact tracing question, uh, we do continue to expand our um, our workforce at the state level, right? We were um, we took on the role uh, uh, in partnership with local public health to provide surge uh, contact tracing capacity. Uh, we now sit at the state uh, at 100, or excuse me, 285 contact tracers. Uh, we will have an additional 47 that will start on Monday. Uh, we'll go through their training and, and be able to get on the phones uh, and get in the mix on contact tracing uh, after that, uh, as we drive uh, at the state towards a number of about 400 contact tracers. Um, uh, but again, uh, we've got to get to a place where our daily new uh, positive cases uh, is not overwhelming the system, uh, because right at the f on the front end, it overwhelms the public health infrastructure and their ability to do contact tracing. The lagging indicators are our hospitalizations and deaths. And, and, and so um, until we see new daily cases go down and we start to take that pressure off local public health, it is not going to um, uh, carry forward into reduced hospitalizations and deaths. And so we've got to do this work now. Uh, we've got to do it together so that all of our systems, our public health system, our healthcare system uh, can handle this pandemic uh, and, and keep us all as, as healthy and safe as is possible. Did you want to say any more, Dr. Well, Scott, I think the one, one piece yeah. in there I'd, I'd pick up is that, like, are we, are we past that? Is it, or is it, are we beyond the point where contact tracing is useful? And I think the answer to that is, clear, is very clearly no. And again, there's, you know, there's, there's two types of contacting or, or interviews that contact tracers do. There are the case interviews. So everyone who tests positive gets called by a contact tracer, and they ask the questions, who have you been in contact with, and where, and what sort of gatherings have you been to? So that's a standard that we need to continue for, forever, because those people need support, and they need, and they need advice and recommendations. The second piece that contact tracers do is all of the contacts that are identified through those interviews ideally will get contacted and notified by public health to tell them what they need to know. That's the piece where we're not able to keep up. And so there are ways that we can do that. We can educate the public about what it means to have been exposed, the need to quarantine. We can engage with cases or in their families to the extent that they're able to notify their contacts. So in, in any of those cases, you know, I don't think it will ever stop being beneficial to give people the advice that they need to quarantine, meaning stay out of contact with others if they've been exposed to the virus. We just right now don't have the resources to, to specifically call every person who's been exposed. I think it's a good goal to get back to that point, but, but as the Secretary said, we're not going to get back there until we really turn the curve and stop this, this, the wave of new infections. Thank you, Danny. Now to Madeline Anderson from Fox 6 in Milwaukee. Madeline? Hello, my question is for Governor Evers. Um, you had said that you wouldn't be doing these briefings twice a week if this wasn't an urgent crisis. And yet, as you guys have noted, we keep seeing these new records almost every day or every week. First of all, why do you think your message isn't resonating with all Wisconsinites? And follow-up question, is it time to change your message? Perhaps focusing more so on people who aren't symptomatic, you know, for example, should everyone at this point just assume they have the virus? Thank you. Sure. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, all of this is, a, is uh, around individual responsibility. You know, we can do the orders, and that sets the stage and sends a message to the people of Wisconsin that, you know, right now we have an order around face coverings. That sends a message to the people of the state of Wisconsin. That's an important thing. Wear a mask. Second of all, we have an order out there that limits public gatherings. The message around that is don't go out and hang out with a bunch of people, especially in small spaces where you can't socially distance. So we continue, we, and we'll continue to do that. But at the end of the day, it has to be around individual responsibility. 
you know, we, we talk about who's going to be policing this effort. Individual, every person in Wisconsin is policing this effort. This is not something, you know, I'm hopeful that police departments will, if they say some, see something wrong, they'll, they'll remind people of their obligations to, the, to their neighbors around being safe. But at the end of the day, we are sending the message that you have to mask up, you have to have face, uh, facial covering, and you have to uh, be careful about public gatherings. Now, you know, and I talk about this every week, and I'll talk, continue talking about it. When we have inconsistent messages from our leaders, whether they're local or state or national, that's a problem. People do listen to leaders. Now, I'd say at this point in time, because of uh, the, what I see every time we have a order, we end up in court and Republicans or their allies are, are part of that uh, effort. Um, that's a problem. That sends a message to the people of Wisconsin that Republicans don't care about this. I don't believe that for a minute. I know Republicans that do wear masks. I've seen, I've seen the speaker wearing a mask. So the, the idea that somehow Republicans are, you know, I'm sure there's some, I read. But if for the most part, I think it is a bipartisan effort. They do want you to be safe. They do want you to stay healthy. They do want you to have face coverings. They do want you to make sure that you're not hanging out with a bunch of people in a small room with nobody wearing a mask. I'm just hopeful that because I believe, I know Republicans that feel that way. I see the actions of some Republicans. I encourage them to speak up too. This is not a one-man band here. This is an important issue in the state of Wisconsin. We have well over 3,000 deaths, um, or excuse me, of cases uh, this, this last seven or eight days. You know, if you think about preventable deaths. Let's just do the math here. Uh, I'd say on the low side, 1% of people that um, are, are identified as COVID-19 die. Yeah, it's not just under that number. So think of 3,500. There's 35 people out of that group on average that will not be here. Come on, folks. Let's all get together. It's individual responsibility. This is not a, this is not a political statement. Thank you, Madeline. Now to Rob Sussman from WTAQ Radio in Green Bay. Rob? Yeah, thanks so much for taking my question. Um, my question is for uh, the public health leaders here. Um, is there any evidence whatsoever that any of the mitigation strategies that public health is currently uh, performing in the state between the mask mandate, the gathering mandate, is there any evidence whatsoever that any of it is working? Thank you. Yeah, Rob, I'll, uh, I'll let Dr. Osgrad dig in a little here. I think um, one of the things we've talked about throughout this pandemic is the lessons we've learned uh, from uh, watching uh, folks around the globe as well as states around the U.S. And I think uh, one thing that is certainly very clear when you look at the surges that happened uh, in the South and uh, in other parts of the state uh, um, in, in the months preceding the current situation that we are in, um, there is uh, there's not a state whose hospitals were um, filling up the way ours are filling up that did not take uh, mitigation strategies uh, similar to and um, and exceeding the ones that we have taken here in the state of Wisconsin. There is um, there is no doubt that uh, the way you stop the spread of this virus is is by reducing contact between people. Um, and and uh, the, the way you do that is through wearing a mask, through physical distancing, through not gathering with people outside of your home. Um, these are tried and true, tested and proven public health interventions. Um, and, and states uh, across this country and countries around the world have used them uh, to bring their outbreaks under control. And it is what we need to do here in the state of Wisconsin. So I think there's a couple of ways to answer that question. One is, 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 there, is there evidence that the strategies are effective? And the evidence is, is very strong. And we review that, that, that scientific literature about the effect of face masks on reducing transmission, the effect of, 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 of physical distancing of greater than six feet. So the science is very clear that those are the determinants that, that decide whether 
a person with the virus spreads it to the other. I don't think that's what you were asking, though. I think you were asking, you know, are, are the policies and the messages that we've done to try to get this, implement this strategy working? And I think it's a fair question, but I think the evidence is overwhelming that they have. What, what we know about the virus in terms of how quickly it spreads through a population, if we do nothing, is that it's very rapid and a large proportion of the people will become exposed in a relatively short period of time. We saw that in, in the first several weeks in the city of Wuhan in China. We saw that in April in New York City. So left to its own devices, we could have 10 times more cases and more deaths than we have right now. In fact, that's what would be expected if we didn't do infection prevention like we're doing. So the strategy that we've done, and, and so I think that's important for us to, you know, the, the whole state, not just public health, but to acknowledge what we've accomplished. Knowing what we know about this virus, it could have been dramatically worse, 10, 20 times worse than it is. The only reason it's not is because we have done the things that the evidence shows reduces transmission, and that's face coverings in public, keeping gathering small, hand washing, isolation, quarantine, and scaling up testing. So yes, I'd say strongly the evidence suggests that what we've been doing has made a very large difference. Thank you, Rob. Now to Mitchell Schmidt from the Wisconsin State Journal. Mitchell. Yeah, thank you very much for the call today. Um, Governor, it, it's been about a week since you asked Republican leaders to meet on uh, COVID-19 measures, two weeks since they sent a similar uh, request to you. Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about where everything stands with that meeting. Has anything been scheduled? And, and if not, uh, do you have any sense of what the holdup is? Thank you. Yeah, and uh, I, we, we have not heard, uh, but clearly, uh, I think both leaders do want to meet at some point in time. I'm, I'm guessing the, uh, the, the national election is playing a, a role in that, but I have not heard, and I'm waiting for them to uh, put some plans uh, in place that, uh, on paper so that we can, uh, we can talk about that. But to answer your question directly, no, I have not received a letter to my knowledge. Thank you, Mitchell. Now to Katrina Nickel from Fox 11 in Green Bay. Katrina? Hi. Hi there, thanks for taking this question. So my question is for Governor Evers. Um, more about this, you know, bipartisan, you said you wanna make a bipartisan effort to uh, help reduce the spread of the virus. So what, where's the disconnect and, you know, what's the solution to um, get everybody on the same page? Great question. <laughs> We've been trying to be on the same page for uh, for some time. Uh, hopefully, at some point in time in the near future, we'll sit down with the Republican leaders and determine whether the, those mitigation strategies um, uh, that we know work. And I'll repeat them again, facial coverings, making sure that you're socially distant and uh, be concerned about public gatherings. What can we do together on that? And whether it's uh, something legislatively or, or not, but um, uh, we, we, we have to have folks understand how important this is and that uh, if, if their, if their uh, caucus is not uh, on board with uh, facial coverings and uh, social distancing, uh, then there won't be any uh, in agreement. Thank you, Katrina. Now to Sean Kirkby from Wisconsin Health News. Sean. Hi, um, hi, thank you for holding this. Um, I was wondering um, for the uh, surge facility in West Allis, um, are there, have there been any changes in um, its criteria for accepting patients, so the hierarchy of the patients are being accepted? Um, can you uh, elaborate on whether or not you're looking to make changes to allow higher QD patients? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, John. I, I, I'm going to ask uh, Deb Standards to weigh in here. I, I would say broadly um, that right, this alternate care facility is designed uh, to to be a backstop for our hospitals across the state, and 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 we are in constant conversations with them about uh, how we uh, how we move through this uh, together. Um, and so I know Deb and her team have been having a lot of conversations uh, with them uh, specific to your to your question. And so I will ask her to weigh in on on that if she would. Thank you, Secretary Palm. You're absolutely correct. Daily, we have conversations with our healthcare partners about how we can uh, integrate with them in helping serve the patients in our community. We have made changes based on the feedback we have 
received from the healthcare facilities. For example, we now are, are able to uh, administer rendesivir to patients. And I've got to thank the Department of Health Services and the Department of Administration who wrote uh, a very uh, an appeal to the FDA to include alternate care facilities in the regulation in terms of facilities that can administer this very important drug. And within 36 hours, the FDA came through and gave uh, the ability for alternate care facilities across the United States to be able to do that. That was a game changer for our healthcare facilities because there are several patients on this drug. We listened to our healthcare partners and we responded with the help of uh, Department of Administration, Department of Health Services. We have looked at other areas in terms of age criteria, in terms of patients in the emergency department, and we've made changes to our criteria based on that. So we are flexible, we are nimble, and we are responding to the needs that our healthcare partners are asking of us. Thank you, Sean. Now to Mason Dowling from WAOW-TV in Wausau. Mason. Hi, uh, my question is for DHS and health officials. We just had a presser earlier today with Aspirus Health Systems, you know, one of several hospital groups here in central Wisconsin that says the virus is uh, starting to impact their uh, employees as well. Uh, are you hearing more reports of hospital systems saying that now their, you know, doctors, nurses, healthcare workers are starting to feel the effects of the virus and caring for all those affected as well? Yeah, so it certainly is one of the implications of uh, community spread at the level and intensity that we're seeing it around the state of Wisconsin because right um, uh, at, that, at that kind of uh, widespread community transmission, um, uh, your healthcare workers uh, and, and other employees in those settings uh, leave work and they go out into that community to do their shopping uh, and their other essential errands and, and uh, either can be infected with COVID or can be in contact with someone who is. And um, those folks can't, um, you know, they can't come to work. They, they need to quarantine. They need to get tested. They need to do the things that are necessary to make sure uh, that they are healthy and well. And so that certainly um, is something that is impacting uh, our hospitals and nursing homes' uh, ability uh, to, to remain fully staffed. And so, right, our capacity in those systems is not just the sheer number of beds, but it is adequate staff to, to appropriately staff those beds. And so it's a really important part of how we maintain the capacity of our healthcare system it is why we talked back in March and April about needing to flatten the curve to protect our frontline healthcare workers and hospital systems. It is that, that piece of their potential uh, infection and need to quarantine and um, therefore getting pulled out of the workforce uh, um, as, as they await their results and understand their health before they can go back to work. So um, the deployment of rapid Testing uh, is something we have been uh, doing for hospitals um, uh, thanks to some assets that the federal government has provided to us to help ease, to help do, uh, again, rapid testing to get those folks who can back into the workforce as quickly as possible. Uh, we've done a number of things on the regulatory side to improve flexibilities uh, for our hospital systems, including uh, allowing um, out-of-state licensed providers uh, to fill those gaps. Uh, we have a, a volunteer um, a system that we call Weaver, where folks who are, are licensed providers can um, register with the system and be available to volunteer so that they can fill short-term gaps of, uh, um, in staffing needs. Uh, we also, uh, uh, when, when it's necessary and appropriate, can make staffing requests to FEMA uh, if it gets to that point uh, as well. Um, but we are pulling all the levers that we can um, because, again, our, our bed capacity um, uh, our capacity in our, our hospital systems is not just about beds, it's about adequate staff uh, to provide that care. So it's a really important piece of this and something we're, we're very focused on. Thank you, Mason. Now to Katie Anderson from WBAY-TV in Green Bay. Katie? Katie Anderson from WBAY. Okay, we'll move on then to Stephanie Hoff from WIS Politics. Stephanie? Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon. My question is for the governor. Uh, so we're about two weeks into the capacity limitations, um, one uh, incubation period for the virus. Will you extend the order because cases are not going down? Well, it's certainly something we're under we're looking at. Uh, never say never in this in this business. We'll do whatever we can to protect the people of Wisconsin. Uh, but um, yes, we that order was based upon two incubation periods, and uh, uh, we're, we're getting close to the end. So uh, anything is on the table, but uh, no decisions have been made yet. You, Stephanie. <clears throat> now to Todd Richmond from the Associated Press. Todd. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Uh, I just wanted to circle back to the, the questions earlier about the messaging. I mean, clearly, you've been saying, you've been delivering the same message now since March. Clearly, it's fallen on far too many deaf ears across the state. It's ineffective. And what is your plan B, or is the plan just to continue to tell people to mask up and, and watch them ignore it? Or is there no plan B? Uh, what is, your, what is the different tactic here? How can you change tactics? Well, first of all, as, as you heard before, Todd, that the, we believe that the orders have made a difference. It would be worse without them. And uh, frankly, the science is all about the things we're talking about. I, can't, I just can't make up crap out of thin air here. Uh, so we will continue, continue to have that conversation around the things that we know work. So we're looking at a, a number of people that uh, uh, are not complying. Uh, Seventy-some percent in the state uh, indicate they support face coverings. Uh, so I can assume that uh, at least or about that number, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, are, uh, are complying. And so we will uh, be working on that 20 percent. And frankly, uh, I believe um, uh, having our uh, communicator-in-chief uh, uh, president of the United States could help in this arena. Clearly, he has now he has uh, keeps talking about us turning the corner. Uh, everything's going to be good by Christmas. I heard that about Easter, um, and so there there is a, there is a belief I think on most part of of this country that the president thinks this isn't a big deal. Well. As I just said before, out of the 3,000 that uh, that uh, we identified today as positive, you know, one percent or maybe a little less are going to die. I I just can't believe that that is turning the corner. That's not turning the corner. So we we need consistent communication from our leaders, and we're not getting it. So I will continue to work on that angle. Uh, if some new science comes up, and I don't have to make up stuff out of thin air uh, to get people to do it. Um, we will certainly advocate for new science, but at the end of the day, the things we're talking about now are still important. We just need the leadership, a uniform um, a leadership effort to uh, communicate that. Thank you, Todd. Now to Lane Kimball from News 3 Now in Madison. Lane? Lane Kimball, WISC. Okay, we'll move on then to Heather Poltrock from WSAW in Wausau. Heather. Um, hello. Some people who've been diagnosed with COVID-19 are continuing to see health impacts quite a few months later. And we've talked with a few individuals who have not been cleared to go back to work because of that. And doctors really don't have good treatment for them. So can you share, are there... Um, any plans for, uh, or sorry, so statewide, or, or in terms of how many people are getting these longer lasting impacts, what hope is there for treatment and um, what can help these people get back to work? So, so the, the, that's, it's, uh, thank you for, for raising that. It's, it's definitely true. We've observed that people can feel quite lousy for a long time, even after they've been through the 10 day period that we think they are infectious. So. What, what's behind that is you know, the, the virus causes an acute illness, causes the fever and the runny nose and the cough, but then there's a, a whole range of other kinds of damage mediated by the immune system and, 
and other things that we don't fully understand that can cause damage to the body that takes a long time to heal. Um, so it's, it, it is quite common for people to continue to have symptoms for some time. The best science indicates that even among those patients, if, as long as their fever has gone away and they have, um, b by all accounts, a, a normal immune system, they don't remain contagious for more than 10 days. So people can generally return to work after they meet that 10-day window for um, discontinuation of isolation, even if their symptoms haven't resolved. Um, and there's a lot of you know, additional research about treatments and actually just understanding of these of why people tend to feel so poorly for as long as they do. But that doesn't have a huge impact on when people are able to return to work from an infection control perspective. They may not feel well enough to go back to work, but what we know about the virus in terms of how it spreads, most people are no longer infectious after 10 days. Thank you, Heather. Now to Mayan Silver from Milwaukee Public Radio. Mayan. Hi, sorry about that. I'm, I'm here. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, we've been hearing that President Trump is going to come again to Wisconsin this weekend. I'm not sure if that's been completely confirmed. Um, do you have any evidence? Like, wh what's your reaction to that for Governor Evers? And do you have any evidence um, in terms of for the public health officials of, the, of these events being spreaders or super spreaders? Well, my, re my response is twofold. One is, uh, as, as you know, uh, even though they're outdoors for the most part, um, those events have people sitting shoulder to shoulder, talking to each other, yelling, screaming, dancing uh, without masks. And so that's just not where I believe uh, we need to be as far as sending a message. And then we have uh, the president essentially saying, we're rounded the corner, things are fine, da da da. So, you know, I, I can't control his, his political message, um, even though it's dead wrong. Uh, but um, uh, he should, be, I know he has the ability to um, set parameters for his uh, audience. And I would expect him to do that. Not just hand out masks, not, not just say, wear them, but they should, he should essentially say, if you're not wearing a mask and you're not sitting six feet apart, don't come. I mean, that, that, that should be his message. Do I think that's going to happen? Absolutely not. There's no, there's no data to support that. There's no information in, in my worldview that says that he's been doing that. So it'll be a disappointment because he's not following science, but um, not a surprise. Thank you, man. Now to Mary Jo Ola from TMJ4 in Milwaukee. Mary Jo. Hi, thanks for taking uh, this call again. Um, this may be a question more so for Secretary-Designate Palm or for Ms. Uh, Deb Sandridge. Um, regarding the alternate care facility, uh, I think it's the Wisconsin Hospital Association yesterday told us that um, it's been tough to get patients to go there to receive care rather than at the hospital. I'm just curious to hear do you guys see that as a challenge, as a concern? Should there, do you think as far as addressing the current strain on healthcare system? Yeah, Deb, I'll let you take that as you've been having conversations with the hospitals. It's, it's a great question. None of us have been through a pandemic. And presenting the option of going to an alternate care facility to a patient is a brand new patient care model. It's not their neighborhood hospital that they're used to going to for when they're ill, but also when they're healthy. So it's having that conversation because they ask, well, what does this mean? Is it, is it like a hospital? Is it, do they have licensed healthcare professionals? That's why we put together a brochure that the caregivers can give to the patient at their bedside. We also have been able to have, when the caregivers ask us to, have conversations with patient families. I've had conversations with patient families who have, uh, have been considering coming here in terms of assuring them this is a license, we have licensed care professionals, we have licensed RNs, we have respiratory therapists, et cetera. 
we are an alternative to continuing your care that you're now receiving in a hospital. But this is brand new. It's unique. It's unknown to the patient. And those continual conversations we need to have with patients and families during this unprecedented time is what's occurring right now, familiarizing them with this brand new model that is in place in Wisconsin. Sophie Carson from USA Today Network, Wisconsin. Sophie? Hi, um, thanks for the call today. Uh, my question is following up on a Washington Post story that came out a few days ago that uh, almost 300,000 Americans, uh, more, about 300 more, I'm sorry, more uh, have died this year um, than previous years due to COVID, but also um, other causes of death. In Wisconsin, that's about 2,800 more people who have died um, than during an average year. Uh, looking for um, anyone's comment on that um, as to sort of the, the effect this virus has had on, on the state. Have you, have you looked? That's about a Harvard study, I think, right? Yeah, no, I'm not familiar with the, the, the paper itself, um, but I, I think the you know, uh, national data suggests you know, all-cause all mortality has been has been elevated because you know during the pandemic and it's a combination of between you know cause death directly due to COVID-19 potentially other other explanations are deferral of care during the period where a lot a lot of you know medical care was being given in, in the same way and people were nervous about going to the hospital for root, for 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 routine care or for emergency care I think there's a lot more study that needs to have done to understand the the mechanisms for that, um, but it hasn't just been death due to the virus. It's 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 a good point, but I, I haven't read the the study or the paper yet. Thank you, Sophie. Now to Denise Lockwood from Racine County, I. Denise. Thanks for taking the call. Um, as I'm looking at the uh, dashboards you guys have on the race and ethnicity, um, I'm I'm wondering are black people actually people of color experiencing this this virus differently and how you're addressing that with allocating resources to those areas so i think um one of the things that's was really important from our perspective about uh, adding that dashboard and that information to the website um was uh to put it into some context um not only uh, relative to um their percentage of population uh, in the state, um, but uh, uh, to, to give some more focus on what we know are underlying um, uh, inequities uh, that, that result in, in worse health outcomes, not just from COVID, but uh, other, um, uh, other diseases for people of color and our indigenous um, native populations, uh, right? What we know, um, is that uh, our health and well-being is inextricably linked to um, to um, the safety of our neighborhoods, to poverty, to other factors um, that influence our ability um, to be healthy and well, and and that those things that are outside of um, uh, of our control in many ways um, are, are, are disproportionately impact the people of color of this state and, and across the nation. It is why. Uh, the governor has stood up uh, a health equity council um, to help us focus on these issues, to help us focus on root causes and and um, really tr uh, put our shoulder against uh, solutions that will help uh, make sure that everyone in Wisconsin is able to live their best, healthiest and, and safest life. Um, and so uh, it was just a really important um, additional um, way for us to elevate these issues, uh, for us to um, make that data available for folks to really understand what we're seeing here in Wisconsin uh, and, and, and help us um, keep moving in the right direction uh, to, to do the work we need to do to eliminate health disparities and health inequities here in Wisconsin. Thank you, Denise. Now to Winnie Dorch from CBS 58 in Milwaukee. Winnie. Hello. Hello, um, thank you for taking my question. Just curious to know, what's kind of like the age group, like the population that's been affected by the recent high numbers and deaths? Is it like old people, younger people, like certain race or populations affected? And why do you think so? 
Yeah, I, we're seeing a you know pretty good um, uh, spread across age groups. It's not particularly concentrated. I, I I haven't looked at the graphs on the website today to see what the our thirty four hundred today how that's uh, broken down. Um, but but that information is absolutely um, allocated across the charts. And visualiza visualizations on the website. I don't. I don't know if you've had a chance to dig into them. It's not. It's not one age group more than the other. All, you know, every age group has been increasing, not specifically at the same time. The, the the group of 18 to 24 around you know early September was really leading the charge in terms of a very steep increase. Um, they're no longer the highest rate of increase in new cases. Right now, all the other age groups have caught up. So, so right now, it's truly across the board, high, high, high disease activity level and an increasing trajectory in every age group that we measure. Thank you, Winnie. Now to Julia McDonald from the New York Times. Julia? Hi, can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Thank you so much um, for speaking with us today. Um, I'm wondering, so the field hospital has been described as an ultimate insurance policy. Does the fact that a patient was sent there signal that the situation has become even more dire? And I'm wondering if there's any information that you could give us about the circumstances surrounding the patient's arrival at the hospital. Uh, so I, I'll, um, I'll, let, uh, I'll let Deb uh, weigh in on this. I think, um, the alternate care facility uh, is our ultimate insurance policy, right? It is the backstop for our healthcare system, for our hospital systems, should they uh, um, breach capacity that um, um, that doesn't allow them to care for the people that that, that are in their care, um, and and they need us to help fill that gap. Um, you know, they're, they've worked very hard on their surge planning. Um, and on their ability uh, and their work together across regions and um, across communities to share resources and share capacity as is necessary, but but um, it's important for us to be there uh, should they should they need us. But I, I I'll I'll ask Deb Deb to weigh in uh, in more detail. Secretary Palm, I echo your comments. Our hospitals are working very hard to optimize their capacity with the staffing resources that they have. They are working at uh, uh, being able to look at keeping those patients close to, close to them in the community. But we also have to remember that hospitals aren't just caring for COVID-19 patients. They are caring for cardiac, they're caring for oncology, pulmonology, trauma, et cetera. So it's that pressure that the hospitals are having that they end up having conversations with us as they are trying to manage their bed capacity and their staffing resources. And that's where we come in, as Secretary Palm said, as the insurance policy, should they need us. Thank you, Julia. Now to Eric Gunn from Wisconsin Examiner. Eric? Hi, thank you for taking the question. I. Um, the, the, set of the, the head of the state Senate Health Committee said this week that there's really nothing more that state government could do with regard to addressing uh, COVID-19. Governor Evers, do you believe that, 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 there, that more could be done should the legislature choose to reconvene? And assuming that, they, that you do, uh, what would be your three, three to five big priorities for you for, for their action to address the p pandemic? Thank you. Yeah, I I just don't think it's, and I, I read that comment too, and it uh, took my breath away a little bit. We, we, we just can't say, ah, let's see what happens. Uh, that, that is not uh, an appropriate response. And, uh, you know, I've asked for specific ideas from uh, the Republicans, and, you know, their response uh, up until this point in time has been, you know, a lawsuit here, a lawsuit there. Uh, criti criticism in public and a lot of silence. And uh, so, and frankly, that's one of the reasons uh, we apparently lost in the uh, uh, Supreme Court the very first time was that uh, the Republicans said they had a plan. I haven't heard it. So again, I've, I'm looking forward to getting some specifics from them, but I, you know, I don't want to be a broken record, but there are basics at work and I won't repeat them again. 
uh, we need to get the rest of the state that is not complying to comply. We have our business, our businesses are are complying. Our, our you know, there's lots of people that are complying individually. That that uh, uh, we just need to get over the hump so that all people comply and understand that it isn't about um, complying. It's about being safe and and making sure that you're not infecting your neighbor or you're not being infected by them. And so it, it, it is, I, I, won't, I won't dissuade anybody or I won't try to argue any, anything other than those points. Uh, there may be science that comes up that we could add to the, add to the um, uh, mix, but uh, it's pretty basic stuff. I would like to also, uh, and if we get a chance, maybe uh, the legislators can think about Re, you know, they sent a letter, se several dozen of them, I believe, to the federal government early on in the pandemic saying, don't send us any money uh, to the federal government, that the letter went. And I'd like them to retract that. Uh, we need money. We need federal money. They can, they can print it. We cannot. And uh, our small businesses need it. Our farmers need it. Lots of people in the state need it. We need it to make sure we continue to do our good work. And I think uh, uh, having some official uh, action on that piece would be very, very helpful. Thank you, Eric. Now to Patrick Palo Antonio from WISN TV in Milwaukee. Patrick? Yes, thank you. Uh, I have a question about hospitalizations and also the alternate care facility. So as the hospitalization rate goes up, what are you seeing with age groups of those hospitalized? Are they trending younger? And when it comes to the alternate care facility, is the effort to familiarize people with this type of model the reason why there's only one patient there right now? Thank you. I guess I'll say a couple things and then um, Deb and Dr. Westergaard can weigh in as well. I think, um, you know, again, the alternate care facility is is – is our insurance policy, it would be our preference and it would be the preference of the hospitals that we be able to manage this disease at the local level in, in the communities where these families live um, uh, and, and not need this ultimate insurance policy. And it is the work that Safer at Home allowed us to do in this spring was uh, that surge planning, that um, work on the ground with the hospitals so that they could be making those plans, um, uh, thinking through that stuff, figuring it out, it, it, and they are executing on those plans now. And so um, uh, I don't, I, we should celebrate every patient that doesn't come to the alternate care facility um, because that means that we are managing this disease. It hopefully means that we are doing the things we need to do to stop transmission, uh, that more folks are staying home, more folks are wearing face coverings, more folks are being super vigilant about physical distancing, uh, and that we're doing that work together uh, to allow our hospital systems and our frontline healthcare workers to provide the care that is needed in, in those hospitals in those communities um, and, and that the alternate care facility doesn't need to come into play uh, in, in this response. Um, but again, if we're needed, we want to be there for, for these hospitals and it's why the work that Deb and her team is doing uh, is, so, is so important. And, and Deb, I'll, I'll let you provide any additional commentary you'd like to. Secretary Palm, you, you stated it beautifully. You, that was absolutely accurate. I will tell you that in the state of Wisconsin, we are truly blessed with an incredible healthcare system, with hospitals, leaders, everyone working on behalf of our residents here in, in Wisconsin during these very challenging times. Everything you said is spot on. Thank you, Patrick. Now to Joe from WORT Radio in Madison. Joe? Hi, thanks for taking my call. Uh, so my question is pretty much, so as we're kind of coming up to the holiday season, there's probably gonna be a increase in cases and such. So what preparations are being made for Thanksgiving and other events coming up? Well, we're encouraging people to stay at home and uh, uh, make sure that the people that they're with, uh, the, the numbers are the immediate family. Uh, 
in my case, uh, there will be Kathy Evers and Tony Evers, period. Uh, we have three children and nine grandkids, and uh, they are not in our immediate family, at least physically. And uh, they're in our hearts, but not physically. And um, uh, the, uh, we're encouraging people to make the celebration small. I know that's a huge, huge issue, but uh, I'll go back to uh, everything I said today, but summarize that there are preventable deaths that we um, can, there are deaths we can prevent. Simple as that. If we can prevent deaths, we should prevent deaths. That should be a top priority. Thank you, Joe. Now to Matt Piper from the Sheboygan Press. Matt? Uh, yeah, thank you for taking this call. Um, with contact tracers reporting that they're overwhelmed by the number of cases, is the state considering outsourcing any of these calls to private vendors or or also alternatively using apps for contact tracing? And, and why or why not? Yeah, so Matt, we are, um, everything is certainly on the table as with this whole outbreak response, this whole pandemic response, we have uh, we have changed and moved and adjusted and responded uh, as the virus has continued uh, to evolve uh, throughout this pandemic. I think we at the state level continue to plus up our resources to be able to provide surge uh, uh, and backup to local public health departments. Um, but fundamentally, um, uh, we should not be chasing this disease with contact tracers. We should be doing what we need to do to stop the spread and get to a place where our public health infrastructure is not so overwhelmed that it can't handle the number of new daily cases and the contact tracing that's required by those numbers. And, and those um, mitigation strategies are how we get Wisconsin back on the right track. They are staying at home. They are wearing a mask. They are vigilant physical distancing. They are the good hand hygiene um, and making safe choices uh, uh, to prevent, uh, as, as the governor just said, um, to prevent unnecessary deaths uh, and really do what we need to do uh, to get us back to a place where we can manage this disease more effectively uh, until there is a, a vaccine available for us. Thank you, Matt. Now to Maddie Heim from the Appleton Post Crescent. Maddie. Hi, thanks for having this call. Um, just another question about the contact tracing. Um, so given what you just said about, you know, not chasing the disease with the contact tracers, I'm just curious, um, are you giving any thought to redeploying some of the 75 million that it looks like we've um, dedicated in the CARES Act funding to contact tracing, um, moving that around to any other um, tools to help stop the spread, given that um, tracers are a little bit limited, uh, more limited now than they were before with effectiveness, or is that all going to um, still be used to keep hiring more tracers? Mm -hmm. um, so, so we have been in, in um, uh, working with uh, local public health to, to on those contracts, because right, what we did, Maddie, was um, uh, provided to local public health departments funding to hire contact tracers. Uh, we retained this um, surge capacity, this contact tracing surge capacity at the state level, which is the 285 folks we have driving towards 400. Um, and so we have been talking to them about how many they've hired, how much of their money they've spent, uh, what their other needs are, how, how we think about getting from here to the end of the year, considering that the money expires. Um, and, and right, uh, local jurisdictions have hired lots of contact tracers. Um, and so the, I, the idea that they're, um, uh, that they're not utilizing that money is is not accurate. It, it is just a matter of uh, the number of daily, new daily cases outstripping the capacity of uh, uh, of, a, of the workforce that we have plussed ourselves up to um, in, in in anticipation of needing to do contact tracing. So they are all uh, they continue to do this work. They have uh, instituted a variety of um, strategies to make it more efficient to prioritize the work uh, to to do it in, to do the disease investigations, um, you know, like the, like Dane County's uh, announcement yesterday. Um, uh, but local jurisdictions are, uh, are, are, have hired lots of contact tracers. They continue to do 
uh, work in this space, and we continue to be in close contact with them about uh, the CARES Act money that we uh, have provided to them. Thank you, Maddie. And our final question today belongs to NBC 15 in Madison. NBC 15. Okay, with that, that concludes today's briefing. Please continue to monitor the DHS COVID-19 web pages for data and guidance. Additional information can be found on the websites of the Governor, the Department of Workforce Development, the Department of Public Instruction, the Department of Children and Families, and Wisconsin Emergency Management. Be safe and have a great afternoon.